Hello and welcome to episode one of Shared Discovery, the show and podcast dedicated to sharing all the exciting and enjoyable aspects of games and gaming. I'm your host, Victor. Today I'm joined by my co-host, Ron. Ron, how you doing? I'm well. I uh, just came from out of town and a long drive and it's been a busy day, but otherwise I am ready to go. How well, about yourself? It means we get to have fun now. Yes. Relax, talk about the things we love, games. So. To answer your question, I'm doing awesome. Yeah. So I'm very excited to get started today on our first episode of the podcast gig. And today we have a really awesome topic picked out. I th we wanted to pick a starting point, right? And to get people into games or help friends get their other friends into games. So we thought the logical starting point was why? Why should we play games? So we're gonna, today we're going to go through and talk about some of the reasons why we think it's worth playing games. We're going to break down some categories and get into that. But before we get into that, I think it's important that they know who we are, right? So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you got into games, some of your favorite games? Sure. Um, so my background in games is I've been playing them my whole life, ever since my mother introduced me to the board game of life. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's based purely on luck, and she always seemed to win somehow. Mm -hmm. She rigged life. She rigged <laughs> life, yeah. And uh, that's really where I learned that I love winning, and I love that conflict and exploring those uh, social spaces. Yeah. But how about yourself? About the same for me, honestly. Came from my family, my friends. Ever since I was young, my grandparents would play games with me. My mom would buy us games for Christmas on birthdays. Just show up with games. I remember she was a garage sailor, right? So she would come home with just like bins of old games, like Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Game Boy games. And I just was always playing games like that or always going to rent games at the game store. That's a thing you could do. Just so you guys know, <laughs> that was a thing you could do. Renting board games. Rent, yeah, rent, well, GameCube games, oh, video games. Oh, right, right, Blockbuster. Well, family stuff. video. Yeah. So that, it's always been a part of my life for to hang out with friends, family, and even into adulthood, we still have family, like friend gatherings just based around playing games, right? All the time. Right, yeah. we've played games for over a decade now. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell them that. Though. I have a game <laughs> going right now that yeah. is, it takes hour, eight hours to play, and we've been breaking it up into chunks, playing it every single week, which that's has a, just been sad. That's a great way to do it as an adult, honestly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we used happen. to be able to do that. I remember going to your house and just playing for 12 hours at a time. Oh, yeah, minimum so, 12 minimum. hours. <laughs> and then continue it to Sunday, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So with our backgrounds out of the way, they know a little bit about us. Oh, mm. we did, what are your favorite kinds of games? We didn't get into that. Oh my. Yeah. Um, well, I'm a big fan of strategy games, uh, simulation games, and role-playing games mm. above anything else. Sure. Doesn't matter the mechanics, whether it's video games or board games or card games. Mm. If it has any element of strategy, I'm there for sure. it. Sure. Yeah. You like to optimize for figure out how you can win. Yes. Min win. max. Min maxing. Winning. Well, we'll have a terminology episode for people that don't understand some of the terminology we're using. But yeah, absolutely. The strategy games are awesome, and I, those are like that's kind of second for me actually. Mm. I really the two top things are like, for me are flavor right? Mm. What pulls me into the game, right? What do I like from other aspects of the li of life that is like, draws me in. So if it's a show I like, a different franchise, I really like that kind of flavor. And then I really like the social aspects of games, games that really have high interaction, mm -hmm. right? And so, and that's across all the games for me. And oh, yeah. that goes right into my background, you know, with playing with family and friends a whole life is, I use that as a tool to socialize. So mm -hmm. I guess some examples of that um, off the top are social games, kind of like werewolf, social deduction games, mm -hmm. like that. And then any game that we can squeeze some uh, co-op out of it, right? Basically everything here, Mario Party, Root, Here to Slay. And it's co-op. That's not co-op, but like any social aspect out of it. So 
Now that they know a little bit about us moving forward here, I think we wanted to start off the episode by breaking down some misconceptions about gamers, Ooh. getting some looking at the statistics of who's actually playing. Yeah, because I don't know about you and everybody else at home, but in my experience, uh, there are tons of misconceptions about gaming, gamers, and the stereotypes. We all know these things, right? But really, when you get down to brass tacks, who's playing games? And looking it up here, uh, games are pretty much for everyone. Like, Absolutely. They're social, and that's the critical key component of them, to the point where, as of this year, January, mm -hmm. approximately 3.09 billion active video gamers are out there in the wild. That's a lot. It just That's almost half of the human population. That's so much. Holy cow. So you can find a gamer if you want to, is what you're saying. Oh, yeah. Throw a stone in any crowded room, and you'll probably find it a gamer. It doesn't what matter what they look like. You can find a gamer. Right. And even more shocking is with the stereotypes in mind and all these things, and past experience as well, is 55% of gamers are male and 45% are female. The breakdown just... Yeah doesn't really compute with me, but that's how it goes. It's how it goes. It doesn't compute because the, my whole life I've heard, you know, games are for boys, mm -hmm. girls don't do that. Right. That Facts disprove that, right? The statistics disprove that. And maybe the games that they're playing are looking different. And in fact, in the research that I was showing, you get to these numbers because you broaden the type of games that are played. Not just video games, but you broaden it to like cell phone apps. And when you do that, it, it looks like this, mm -hmm. right? A lot of women are more comfortable playing these types of games, and that's awesome. I want people, that's the point of this episode, to say play whatever game makes you happy. Right. And another shocker was the age range mm. is again mm -hmm. people always tell me yeah. games are for kids look at the colors it's made yeah. to attract like children to play and I'm it's too old for, for adult. that yeah. yeah way too old for that i'm a business owner i can't do these things but most players are in the subset the age of 18 to 34 years old adults adults right where we are and the, and the spread it goes way outside that range. Yeah. There are millions of gamers that are older or younger. Yeah. And uh, as old as like 217 million gamers being 65 or older. That just deproves that notion right there. Just, yeah, gets yeah. rid of it. Throw it out the window. And it's so funny, it's too, because we hear, hear that. I've heard that, too. It's like, I'm too old for that. Games are for kids, right? But mm -hmm. that doesn't even align with my experiences. No. Right? Yeah. One of the most common ways I played games were with my grandparents. Yeah. Euchre with the grandfather oh. was a classic Same. on the holidays. Grandma and grandpa, we played those all the time. Mm -hmm. right? That's how I learned trick-taking games. And those were the first oh, yeah. like 52 card games I played. Right. Mm -hmm. So the age is all over, and that breaks that misconception right open. Right, yeah. and like I said, that, that's from studies as early as this year, yeah. 2023. Yeah. Don't mean to date us, but that's where the data's coming from. And then studies from 2022 show that 66%, or two-thirds of all Americans, that's all Americans, two-thirds, so yeah. two out of every three people play video games. So you just walk into a room, two out of three people are going to play games. Yeah. That's huge. In the States. In, America, like, in the States, yeah. That's huge. So we wanted to break down these misconceptions to, to get that out of the way, that we think there's a place for you in games, right? Age, gender, whatever it may be, we hope this episode communicates to you that there's a place mm -hmm. here. It's wide-ranging, yes. comprehensive, and it can be as simple as chess being one of the best-selling mm -hmm. games in all of history. Yeah. For thousands of years, it's been around, and it's been selling millions of copies a year? Three million copies a year. Three Still. Three million copies. Still. There's movies about it. <laughs> like, there's shows about it. Mm -hmm. it's, and this statistic is to point out that most people have had exposure to games, mm. but fallen off because those games weren't for them. Right. Right. So maybe to point that out is like we all have exposure, but maybe there's 
it wasn't the right exposure. Exactly. So. And I've seen that plenty of times. But before we get into the main topic, mm -hmm. that being part of it, yes. uh, I'd like to do a little disclaimer mm -hmm. that you know, we're probably not going to get everything right. And just we ask that anyone who comments or subscribes or follows us, just uh, be merciful, please. Uh, don't rake us over the coals. Don't be m mean, if you will. And uh, cut us some slack. Constructive uh, feedback. Constructive feedback. Constructive criticism is what we're yes. looking for and we will most likely respond to and take mm -hmm. to heart. Yeah, because we want to improve. We want to have conversations with you guys because there are probably things that we missed, right? Just last yeah. night, we were going through the notes preparing for this. There's like oh, yeah. one glaring point that we missed. Like, how did we miss that, right? So let us know what we missed. We want to have those conversations mm. with, with all of you. And a big part of gaming is improvement and learning yes. the rules. Yes. So if there's any way we can improve our game being the show, the show. Let us know. <laughs> absolutely. So, Victor, take it away. What yes. are some reasons why okay. I play yeah, games? Yeah, absolutely. So, when I started doing the research for this, there's all kinds of articles, all kinds of points. So, I tried to narrow these down into five categories, right? Some of the points might not exactly fit into the categories, but we're going to bounce back and forth to talk about the categories of the reasons why we think it's worth playing games. And this first category is cognitive mental and psychological benefits to playing games. I mean, right? games are mostly mental. Right? They're in the brain, right? Like, yeah. it's stimulating your mind, right? So the first point here is that stimulating brain cells is good, shown to be good for memory, logic, reasoning, thinking. And studies actually show that people who play games, actually, it helps to reduce Alzheimer's and dementia. Wow. Isn't that huge? That's potent. That's very potent. That's staying healthy. Yeah. Like. Because we we were doing last night, right? We were looking mm -hmm. through this, and I was like, what is the average age of dementia? Mm. Right? And it's actually 49. That's so young. That's so young, right? That's like the onset, right? That when its symptoms start showing. And it's anecdotally, with my, my gramps, he played mahjong, solitaire, card games with us every night. And his dementia didn't start showing till his late 70s, right? That's way better than 49. Way better, right? So it, that's an anecdote, but a point to show that there are way there are really long-lasting benefits to playing games and using this engine in our brain, mm -hmm. right? And with that in mind, right, that could be called a therapeutic benefit, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Therapeutic being helping to alleviate some health concern we have in our life. And so I wanted to point this out here. There's going to be therapeutic benefits through all of the categories we go through. So we're going to point those out as we go, right? And the next one actually being that it can help you cope with loss, Lose, um, losing the ups and downs of life, give you a sense of control, help you work through these things that we have to, these skills, coping skills we have to use on a daily basis. Right, right, because yeah. who doesn't feel a loss of control yeah. in just living your everyday yeah. life? Like so many things are just, you have no influence on them, mm -hmm. and they're just going to happen whether you want yeah. it. To or not. And thinking about games, right? Mm -hmm. And especially multiplayer games, you, th what's out of your control, what the other players are doing, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes that's frustrating, and sometimes you, it is very frustrating, but you have to learn to cope through that, oh, work yeah. through that. And sometimes they make you lose. Yep. Sometimes other people make you lose, and that's just gonna happen. And just having things done to you by someone sitting across the table yeah. can feel like icky or like wrong in some ways yeah. and just sitting in that emotion and like <sighs> why do I feel this way yeah. why am I so affected by this exactly so it can be powerful it can be very ther therapeutic mm -hmm. and working through the some of these things right. that we work have to face every day wow. and another long-lasting benefit that I can actually attest to is that board games actually don't reward risky behavior don't reward so to win, we talked about winning, winning's cool, you have to be calmer, 
You have to become more methodical in your choices. You have to become more patient. Unless it's risk. Then it rewards risky behavior. <laughs> Calculated risky behavior. OK, yeah, right? yeah good point. Good methodical. Point. Methodical, <laughs> methodical yes. risky behavior. You get a way out, <laughs> pros and cons. <laughs> yep. And I'm actually a testament to that, too, because we play Magic the Gathering a lot. Mm. And I used to be the grumpy player <laughs> in the group. Yeah. Sorry. It is what it is. It is what it is. But what I learned is people don't want to play with me. Mm -hmm. It ruins the mood. It ruins my fun. Like, why am I playing the game if I'm being the grump? So I actually have calmed down. Mm -hmm. People want to play with me more. I win more often. And I have fun when I'm losing, mm -hmm. too. Right? That's some it's potent, huge. potent energy. It is huge. So that all to say that there's growth to be had. OK. Yeah. yeah. And then in that, right, in that growth uh, category here is, and we talked about this a little bit with st stimulating your brain cells, is that mm. you can learn risk assessment. We just touched on Ooh. that. Strategic thinking, mathematics, right? Yeah. All important. Absolutely. All of those will just make your life better if you know just basics of math and problem solving yes. and uh, uh, what was the first one you said? Risk assessment. Risk we talked assessment. about that in yes. the form of risk, which is really meta. Yeah, <laughs> wow, call back. Call back all already. Right, full circle already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the last point I had here is that it's a way to experience new things and to educate yourself or others. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of educational yeah. games out there. Send it. Send it. And you actually had a really great point about this when we were doing the notes about how games have been used for to help guide wars. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, from hundreds of years ago, I'd say 1700s, 1600s, about that time, uh, various branches of the military would employ gamers to play war play wars yeah. with their neighbors and people that they'd want to fight. So then they would know eh, sort of about how things would go. A great example is in World War II, the women war gamers mm -hmm. of uh, submarine warfare. Yeah. Is the Germans were spending a ton of time sinking Allied shipping, which stopped the Allies from doing very well at all. And these women war gamers developed every single method to deal with submarines that were available yeah. and completely 180 the war effort. Just playing games. Just playing games. <laughs> they changed the outcome of history. And that's the skills that we were just talking about. The risk assessment, being methodical, mm -hmm. strategizing. All that. They, so we are learning, it's really matter, we're learning, our, right now I'm learning actually, <laughs> about history and they used games to change history. You better believe it. And even high-ranking generals would come down and challenge the women, saying, oh, women are less than men. They don't know how to fight war, right? But every single time some hotshot general would challenge them, yeah. the women war gamers would wipe the floor with them. They wouldn't stand a chance. They'd think they'd have some new tactic. Oh, the submarines can do this. The war gamers are already 10 steps ahead of them and know what they're coming up with every single time. I got to say, I love those stories. Anytime you put smug general, especially women, <laughs> can put them in their place. I love those stories. Yeah. So that about wraps it up with the mental, cognitive, social, uh, not social. Not social. Not social, not yeah, yet. benefits. So we're, how about you take us away with some of the physical benefits for playing games? Oh, man. Uh, you'd think there aren't a whole lot of physical benefits for sitting at a table, like sitting, sitting. and playing a game, yeah. right? And not only does it keep your gray matter nice and limber, but it reduces stress. It's inherent stress relief in uh, taking time aside and yeah. doing something that isn't do or die or like work where your whole livelihood depends on it and being able to just step outside the current moment and just breathe and be a human having fun and doing something that yeah. is essentially re releasing endorphins which is happy chemicals yep. and reducing your blood pressure just mm. inherently yes oh absolutely and mm -hmm. 
you could argue that this could have been in the psychological benefits category, right? But we talked about it. We decided to put it here because stress relief is directly related to so many physical benefits. Oh, yeah. Better sleep, mm -hmm. better dieting, less anxiety, reduced depression, all, all of these better eyesight, things like less headaches, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's why we chose to put put this here in yeah. that. And right into the leading right into the next point actually, the with reduced screen time. Oh yeah. That is that's for these physical games, right? Well, there's the, there's the physical games, which are card games, board games, and then there are the video games. So the physical games specifically, how, when you reduce that screen time, studies show that a, sim, a lot of similar things, like improved eyesight, less headaches, better dieting, better sleep, mm. it's huge. Yeah. Just from sitting playing games. Astronomical, yeah. like, and especially with, uh, Screen time can also cause stress, and stress mm. really breaks you down at cellular level. The fact that it affects so many things, like how is that not just the enemy of life in some way? It's like just de-stress, don't be stressed. Stress, and stress research also shows, um, diving into psychology here, Ooh. so there are these things called telomeres on the end of your DNA, oh. and what happens if you're too stressed it will actually erode those telomeres. What? So that it will actively reduce your lifespan. That's incredible. So what you, like you're saying, that research backs up what you're saying, that stress is the enemy of yeah. life. Really? Yeah. And, and I've never had such a low level of stress being a co-owner of a company. I've mm -hmm. never had such a low level of stress since I picked up gaming mm -hmm. more frequently in my 30s now. And uh, that, any r stress reduction is therapeutic. Like yeah. going back to our, um, what was that, mental effects, therapeutic. We're probably gonna say this a few times, the yes. therapy, the, the ability to just bring back uh, health and healing and a lot of home-based active video games, like I remember Wii Fit and things mm -hmm. like that. It was a yeah. great way to get into. Gamifying activity. You got it, yeah. gamifying healing. Yes. And uh, video games, home-based, I, I assume, home-based active yeah, video home -based, games, right? like, uh, Bowling, Wii Bowling. Wii Bowling, and then like VR games recently, oh, in recent wow. years. Yeah. yeah, they've been huge. And on that th therapeutic category, like they've been actually shown to improve the stride and balance functions of people with Parkinson's. With Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease, yes. Wow, yeah, that's pretty rough one yeah. and any help you can get I'm sure mm -hmm. any help you can get is an improvement 100% and that a lot of those more physical games are games like Operation Jenga the yep. Canadian classic Crokinole I know the cornhole yes. family favorite yep. horseshoes too classic. yep throwing something at a target mm -hmm. nothing better than that builds dirt. those motor skills builds that aim Right. And I've heard even just basic video games without having to do the physical part of it, but like doing things in a 3D physical space will improve your reaction yes. time just like these yeah. physical uh, Absolutely. Uh, games like the ones I just listed. Mm. Because it has your brain and your hands all working in tandem. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I can actually speak to some of the benefits of playing games like Jenga, oh. right? Because I have like a hand tremor. It's oh. just a thing I have. Got it checked out. It's fine. Not Parkinson's. <laughs> Hopefully we don't get there. But playing games like Jenga and the, these more physical, like fine motor games mm -hmm. have been frustrating over the years. But mm -hmm. I've found ways to cope with it, right? So like to play Jenga, I have to guide my hand, right? Two-handed Jenga. And it can, yeah. it'd be frustrating, but I found a way to play it and have fun with it and not fix my issue, right? But find, oh, back to our last category of like finding a way to cope with it and work through it. And I've actually, I've been able to weaponize, <laughs> weaponize my tremor I'll in one, one specific way, one specific facet of games. A lot of games have button mashing. Yes. Levels. And there was this one game on our GameCube back in the day, Superman game. It was really bad, 
great, but as kids, we tried to beat every game that my mom brought us, right? And there's this level where you have to close the dam by spamming the button. You had like seconds to do it. We couldn't do it. So I had to go on like a training arc to go in the hyperbolic time training, figure out how to do this and not. And so I was like, all right, I got this tremor anyway. Let's figure it out. So just like flex my arm and it shakes my hand, and if I do it right over a button, it's like And I don't lose those levels anymore. <laughs> Never. I don't lose those levels in Mario Party. I don't lose this button mash. I have friends who are like, I'm not playing this level with you. So a bit, you, you weaponized. I weaponized yeah. my, my ailment. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, like, that's the one example I was thinking about while we were talking about this. It's like, yes, yeah, see? Physical benefits. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You just gotta find the niche category where that's effective, yes. and then just it's out there. Take it's it out home. there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think that brings us sort of to the end of the physical benefits. Mm. They're few, but I would say very potent physical yes. benefits, like the stress relief. I just keep hammering it because yes. it's so important to live a healthy life through stress reduction. And now, and now we know it kills you. It can it kill, kill you. you. It breaks you down, yes. and I don't know about you, but personally, uh, a key to a healthy life, not only stress reduction, but is having a good social life. Yes. And I don't know if you want to get into the oh, social absolutely. aspects of yeah, games. Yeah, I would but. love to, because as I was saying at the top of the hour, social games are actually like that's why I play games, right? The social aspect is why I play games. And you, we talked about how some of these categories will overlap, right? Mm -hmm. Socializing gives me some stress relief as well, right? But since I've used the games as this tool to facilitate communication, it's been used in all facets of life, with friends, family, meeting new people. Oh, yeah. So games are awesome icebreakers. Mm -hmm. right? I've used them in elementary, I've used them in college, I've used them making new friends. And for me, it's like sometimes I don't always know what to say mm. in a conversation, but if there's a game in front of me, I know that I can talk about the game. There's right. always something to say. Yep. And then maybe that can lead to other conversations right. as well. People start bringing up other things that they may be involved with, and there you go. Yeah, absolutely. So Icebreaker is, is huge, mm -hmm. right? A huge way to kind of cut the tension meeting new people for the first time. In conjunction with Icebreakers, there's a specific type of game that is actually really beneficial as an icebreaker. And we've been talking a lot about competitive games, everyone versus everyone, but there's a type of game that we've started getting into recently to kind of cut the tension called cooperative games. And cooperative games are everyone in the group versus the game. Ooh. Right, how do, as a group, do we beat the game that's in yeah. front of us? And these are really great for cutting the tension, decompressing after some stressful games, right. working together, facilitating solidarity. Get you talking again. Getting you talking again. Yeah. Getting you talking constructively again. Getting you talking <laughs> nicely again, right? Because maybe you had a little salty games, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, salty being uh, like irritable, tilted, angry, whatever word you might choose from, like nitpicky, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. So these games have been really beneficial for us in our play group. To, we throw one of those in every game session. Yeah, now. and they can really help you learn how to be cooperative because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a lot of things in life are competitive, just like in most games being competitive games. Yeah. And this builds a completely different skill set. Absolutely. Cooperating and knowing how to cooperate and build relationships. Yeah, and our society pits us against us all the time. And profit motive, how many right. times do you hear this sort of language? Exactly, so like finding a way to like work as a team yes. is fantastic, and these games have been awesome for that, right? right. Even losing together, has, it, you still feel good, you feel validated in that. So the next point that I have here is actually, yeah, I thought it was clickbait, <laughs> is can save relationships. That's, that's a bold statement. Very bold. <laughs> Very bold statement. But, you know, I clickbaited, I got it. And it said that it's not going to be the only thing that saves a relationship, right? But it can help facilitate time for couples 
to have the shared interest and a shared regular time to spend with their significant other mm -hmm. doing something that they both enjoy. And that's the important part, right? Okay. And so there's actually specific games geared towards couples, right? And one that I found is called Unpack That. And this could actually fall right into that therapeutic category that we've been addressing. Yeah. So a little bit of couples therapy while you play games. But this game's awesome because it's for couples to learn how to communicate it with each other in like a mm -hmm. gentle way that's facilitated by the card game. Okay. So there, there are cards that have good questions, bad questions, reflective, tough questions. So like, what's, what's a habit that I have that irritates you? Oh my. What's a good memory you have <laughs> about me? Right, right. Maybe we should play one of these we'll, sometime. That would be fun. We should do that on camera. Here. That'd be awesome. And so just, I really wanted to bring that point. I only saw it in the one article, but I think that's really important to touch on. Yeah. You know, find a shared interest with your significant other mm -hmm. and do that consistently. So. There you go. And this big category here, I think we've been touching on it a lot really is Shared experiences are one of the best ways to connect with people, best socializing tool, mm -hmm. great way to bond with others, and just create these connections with your family and friends. Yeah, too easy. It's, yeah. it's too easy. It it's, feels like a cheat code. Right. right. For me, who, like I said, struggles to always know what to say, mm. whether it's with my family members I don't see all the time, or I do see all the time and I still don't know what to say because we've said it all. <laughs> right, <laughs> there's that too. Right, or friends that you want to catch up with or new friends like the icebreaker. It's, mm -hmm. it's really great for like, helping facilitate that. And I don't know how many more times I'm going to say facilitate. Facilitate. Or games. Games. But, you know, this is for you, Vine. <laughs> You, you know. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> and so we, we talked about um, education, right. a good educational tool. And it's also, games are a wonderful educational tool for kids, specifically right. and teaching them how to communicate, follow rules. It's a big one. Right, and being graceful losers, being honest, all of these, all of these things. And we decided to put this here because a lot of the lessons kids need to learn is how to fit into a society, how to socialize, mm. how do my actions affect the others around me. Yeah, how to cooperate, how to build constructively with other people, how to do all of these skills. Yes. Games, physical or otherwise, they can teach it. Oh, 100%. And I played games my whole life, whether it was for fun or educational games or literally just making up games on the playground. Right, and how many times have you like seen gamified aspects of like a job that you've worked sure. or uh, an event that you've gone to where, oh, there's an Easter egg hunt or there's yeah. a, a collect these certain tokens that you can find yeah. and uh, you get a reward and it's everywhere. Everything is always trying to gamify work and aspects of life that aren't as appealing and it just makes it easier because games are just Fun. They're There's a time. reason they're so yeah. popular. It's reason billions of people play them. So why yeah. not help use those as tools for education, tools for getting through the less desirable parts of life. Exactly. Right? Tools for teaching kids how to be good citizens. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talk, oh yeah, yeah. You're gonna send it? Um, we are gonna send it. Okay. Thank you. How could I forget? Right. It's so fun. It's your favorite part. It's my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> And so we talked about a little bit of how they can be therapeutic, mm. uh, but I also had one, a couple other reasons of how they're therapeutic. Oh. And a lot of the articles said that games are really good reason to, um, really beneficial for people with social anxiety. Mm. Uh, how, you know, I touched on that for myself a little bit. Mm -hmm. How I have had forms of social anxiety and games have helped cut that tension and do it in a comfortable way. Right, some people I know, the only time they go out is to play board games mm -hmm. at a local shop or Friday Night Magic, and it's because of social anxiety or they just don't have a need for that sort of social interaction yeah. as much as others, sure. and uh, it allows them to actually have a space where they can build relationships and get friends and uh, 
uh, work on maybe some of these things yeah, as well. Absolutely. And then the last category I hear, the last therapy mm. I had here was role play therapy. And mm. we touched on that a little bit with unpack that of how you can work through mm. some of the issues you're having. But role yeah. play therapy is this is used by therapists to help a patient work through some um, behaviors that they have in their lives, struggles right. they're having, mm -hmm. anxiety. And the game that I specifically touched on with this was Dungeons and Dragons. Oh yes. It's a role playing game, yeah. right? So for me specifically, I like to use Dungeons and Dragons to help, help with that social anxiety, to help work on different aspects mm -hmm. of myself, uh, such as extroversion. Like I'm more oh. introverted, more right. shy by nature. Mm -hmm. It takes more energy for me to, to speak. So when I play d and I'm like, why not be the opposite? And the first thing that comes to mind for me is empathy, empathy building. If you're mm -hmm. pretending to be someone else, you're putting yourself in their shoes, yeah. you're trying to think like them, you're trying to feel like them. What would this person say yeah. in this situation? And it can be any situation and any type of person. So how can you not learn and grow your empathic abilities if you're constantly practicing empathy? Absolutely. And in psychology specifically, they call that a theory of mind. Oh. Right? When you're thinking about what the other person would be thinking about. Okay. Right? Like, you have an understanding of how they're feeling, how they're thinking about how you're reacting with them. Right. So in D&D, specifically, I ask, I've switched how I play. Instead of being a murder hobo, <laughs> y'all have to get... We'll cover that later. You have to get through that, right? Yeah. It's, it's not just a video game. Like that's When you play D&D &D for the first time, you're like, ah, it's just a video game. I'm going to kill stuff. But it's you, you, once you move past that, I treat D&D &D as, well, what would my character do in this situation? Mm -hmm. And that's really changed my, my experience. Totally and my, different perspective. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's like, how... What? Because I all used to ask, like, what would I do? Yeah, that's a lot mm, different. Yeah. So empathy building is huge. Getting in someone else's head, huge. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we have for the social benefits f of playing games. But I think I'm going to pass it to you for the number one reason to play games. Yeah, as if thinking about how other people are thinking about thinking <laughs> isn't meta or... There's too also heady enough. There's also the looking glass self. Oh, you heard, heard of this theory? This is a sociological Maybe. theory. Maybe yeah, lay it on me. Where you get you develop your identity by thinking about how others might be perceiving you, right? Similar to theory of mind. You're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> so <laughs> this is this is too many levels. But too, okay, we're yeah, not we'll, quite done with the just, levels. Just of move thought. past it. Yeah, right? <laughs> is. If, instead of thinking about thinking, thinking about fun and entertainment, yes. and like, well, well, you play games because they're fun, right? Like, what could be simpler than that? That's probably the main reason to play. Yeah. Games. The number one reason through all the research, because they're fun. And to <laughs> use the Socratic method a little bit, uh, what is fun? Oh, wrong. Uh, Listen, you asked this question <laughs> while we were doing our research. It's like, that's easy. That's it. that's easy, that's right? E right? Okay, let me look, let's just look up the definition. Fun's basic. That's yeah. basic. So, I looked it up, and it says it's enjoyment, amusement, and lighthearted pleasure. Ron, those are synonyms. Those are synonyms. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know what fun is. <laughs> uh, how about we save that for a yes, different episode, gonna... and we put the question out to the yes. audience. Let everybody. Uh, how about you tell us what's fun? What's fun to you? Why? Why is fun? What is fun? And that would be we'll have a whole awesome. Talk. Yeah, we're we're. Let's plan on doing another episode. Send us what your definition of fun is. We'll Bingo. read those out on, on that episode. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, and a big thing that goes along with entertainment is f and fun is calling back to stress. What are you doing when you're de-stressing? You're unwinding, you're relaxing, you're taking it easy. It's a decompression. You're letting that weight off, mm. right? And <sighs> what's okay. better? Wait back on. What's better uh, unwind and relax time than in between activities yep. in your busy day? If you have downtime of five minutes, well, there's tons of match three games and mm -hmm. phone games and things yep. that you can actively be playing. 
in these what used to be empty minutes that add into hours and uh, fun. Some people think you can't have fun without other people being involved, but there's a whole subset of games that are, mm -hmm. are single player, yeah. solo player, yeah. and that can be an escape from daily life and you spend time by yourself, yeah. and that maybe is how you decompress. I don't know about Absolutely. you, Victor, but I I really do enjoy the social aspects yeah. of the games. But there are games I do have a few games where mm. I just I'm like I don't want to think about anyone. Yeah, <laughs> this is my game. Yep. I know I've played it thousands of times. I know the rules. I know the intricacies. I want to dive in, have a chill time, yep. and I. We wanted to put this here because we've been talking about multiplayer games for mm. the past, you know, 40 minutes. But we want to say that there's just as many players that play them by themselves, and that's awesome. Yeah. There are people, you know, with families who just use that to say, I worked all day, I'm done with dinner, I'm done with kids, I'm going to spend this time for myself playing games. Yeah. And that's awesome. Right. Something that you can just use, use to escape and just be... And by yourself. we touched on this too in mm. our misconceptions, our stati statistics, and you addressed this with the phone apps. Is like, yeah, since we have these supercomputers in our pockets, and since apps are huge, that is a huge, huge population of people that play games are the people that play solo and just play phone apps on their commute, like you're saying. Yeah, how many people do you know who carry a phone? That's how many people who could be playing games, <laughs> right? Whoa, all of them. Yeah, right? Everybody I know has this phone, yeah. so uh, let's get on it. Let's exactly. get some games going. Exactly. And um, you, you said it, being comforted by something familiar, but like, what's better than making memories with something familiar? Or even if it's uh, brand new, that's making new memories. And education and, and entertainment go hand in hand. Easily. They try to separate them all the time, but really, you're learning the first time you play a new game you're learning mm -hmm. completely new rule sets oh, yeah and everything about the game and why are they trying to gamify these things because it know we know that things that are enjoyable you learn better it sinks in you build those memories yes. because they're memories you want to build exactly and it's like how easy was it to just pull back fun memories to just draw on those throughout the episode we've been doing it constantly easily mm -hmm. right and we, ha we were talking about this yesterday, about how we have our friend get-togethers, and it's always games. And we can th remember in clear detail of, like, last time, all 12 of us got three TVs, three Xboxes, played Halo. And right. it was great because we were doing a bunch of pairs of two, and we got all to hang out and pair with people we don't normally. Mm -hmm. It's like, how easy was that to recall? Because right. it was so fun. And play games that take large numbers of people and we could actually play them maybe for the first time or first time in a long time. Oh, yes. uh, Halo comes to mind. Yep. We would play that as all together and tournament style, however you want to play it. And I even have more recent experiences with like, uh, 14 player games mm. where it, half the people I don't even know who they are yeah. and we're lying to each other's faces and having a ball right? yeah just calling <laughs> each other out and like yeah it's wild and those make huge memories I, I one video game that we play mm. they're called the jack-in-the-box games yes you remember those so good those are so cool one that we like I can't remember the name should have written it down <laughs> written it down but there's always a judge and then everyone in the audience puts in a word for their category, and then, you know, you're all on your phones, and you're all having a good time. And you, we just do it on the couch. Uh, <laughs> there's one that you draw art for. Yes. It's, it's not Jack in the Box, but it's no, a talking. similar yeah. game where everybody draws art and writes phrases and pairs them together and makes t-shirts. Well, we actually printed off a few of these t-shirts, really? and people wear them around, and we're like, oh, Hey, remember when we did you that? You printed a memory. Yeah, that's exactly. So cool. And like that's a surefire birthday gift is like, okay, yeah. play that game yeah. ahead of time. And then if somebody's like, oh, I love that shirt, boom. Boom. That's a gift. That's such a cool That's a memory. Yeah. yeah. That's self-expression. That's the whole nine yards, mm -hmm. right? And that's my next point I want to make is games provide not only an outlet, but an outlet for expressing who you are 
in your own mind that other people may not be aware of or seeing yeah. uh, self-expression. Exactly. And this is one of those points that we were talking about last night or earlier with the disclaimer that just went over our head. Right. We're like, wow, of course, it's fun to express yourself. And it's like, People back to having difficulty with social anxiety or expressing yourself. Every game you play, there's a reason you play it. Every. It's it's a genre you like. Yep. It's a style you like. The art speaks to you. D and D, right? Like you can try to play someone else, but you're always gonna pump, put yourself into right. that. It comes from within, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I am curious about a uh, fancy chef, so I will play a chef this game and try to get into that headspace, right? It's I may like cooking, so there's my motivation. Yes. I may like basket weaving, so I'll play a basket weaver. You know, yeah. there's endless possibilities and curiosities and interests that can be expressed this way. So I'm playing a character now, and it came out of su such a simple inter like interaction. Um, my partner Savannah, she sent me a picture of a bumblebee. Okay. <laughs> and we were we knew we were gonna play D and D this weekend, the upcoming weekend. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna be a beekeeper. That's what my character is gonna be, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so she, I looked it up, looked if there were anything beekeeper subtype. There was, there weren't. So she made me a custom one. We ran it past the DM, and now my character, he's obsessed with bees. Right. I literally, and I went out and did research on bees. Like oh, I man. can tell you so many things about bees and honey, and so his character is expressing this uh, this fun interaction <laughs> that I had in real life. And now I love bees. So I was like, bees are cool, sure. But now I'm like, bees are necessary <laughs> to our world. Like bees, without bees, we lose over 30% of the food in the world. That's crazy. You're just hitting me with all sorts of crazy facts today. I'm just spitting today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like a direct, exp it's a memory that we made. It's yeah. a direct expression of, so of this experience and it's so layered and it's super cool. Yeah, hitting on every level. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, this is all well and good. Self-expression, mm -hmm. stress relief, like uh, uh, all these intangible things, but I always get this line that games are not practical. They're not, there's no point to play games. I do hear that. It's pointless. It's I feel worthless. like we made that it's up to this point, we've already proved in a lot of ways that they're worthwhile. Right. But they're not pointless. No. But we do hear that, right? A lot of times. So this is another misconception. I think this whole category is about mm -hmm. breaking down this misconception. And this category is the practical benefits to playing games, practical reasons. Right. And this, this next point here could be moved somewhere else, right? But I like to put this here because it's very practical to be able to practice certain aspects of yourself in a safe space, mm -hmm. right? So practice critical thinking, resource management, communication in a space where you know it's not gonna harm you. Yeah. Or you can practice that, take it to your real life experience. Because we have to manage resources all every day. We have to manage time, we have to manage money, we have to picture angles if you're doing if you're measuring and cutting and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so being able to play games where there's money and time management and that really doesn't have any like harm on you, right? Whatever at the end of Monopoly. Eh, moving on. I wouldn't play Monopoly, but that's what came to mind because there's money in Monopoly. But right. Right. at the end of the game, it doesn't matter who has the most money, but at the in life, right, where you put that money, where you put your time, that those have very real impacts. So being able to practice those safely is very practical, I think. Exactly. And with money, oh, we put this here that games are an excellent value for your money. That's good to hear. It's, it's awesome to hear. Like, how many of these games have we spent like $20, $50 on and played dozens of times? Oh, yes. Yes, it may be embarrassing or something mm -hmm. along those lines how much you spend on a game, but just the dollars to hours mm -hmm. ratio is off the charts compared to 
any other type of fun that I may have. Exactly, and we not everyone has infinite money to spend on games, or it's like, I, I can't play games, because there's also this stigma that if you play games, you're gonna spend a lot of money. Because yeah. there are people that do, mm -hmm. and that's totally awesome. But the example I put here, too, is that with a single 52 deck of cards, there are thousands of games you can play for that. Ooh. How much can you get one of those for? Uh, a Dollar. few dollars. A few dollars, two dollars, $2. yeah. $5. Right, and you could, so like just with that, you can keep that with you. You kept a deck of cards with you all the time in high school. Yeah, most days I would make sure to have a deck of cards, either to play cards or do tricks. And I even got a nickname out of it for a little while. Ace, I one of the <laughs> football players. And then anyway, yeah. <laughs> and, that, and, and back to our other point, like that helped us pass time. Mm -hmm. That helped you pass the time throughout the day. Oh yeah. It, during high school. So, oh. The next point being here is, and this is kind of also part of self-expression, but games come in every theme, size, form imaginable. Mm. Right? If you look on the biggest gaming board game site, card game site, boardgamegeek.com, yeah. there are over 140,000 games listed there. Ooh. Yeah. That's a lot. Right? <laughs> With over 80 genres. So. You're gonna be able to find a game that fits your budget, that fits your, the amount of time you wanna spend on games. So we wanted to make that point here that's like, they're practical for people who feel they don't have time or money. Like they're, they're games like you said that cost five, mm. a few bucks that take five minutes at a time. So yeah, practical, practical. Efficient. efficient. And the last thing we wanted to put here, we talk, we've talked a little bit about physical games versus video games. And physical games actually have the benefit of being able to be played anywhere without electricity. Oh, yeah. So you can't really do that with video games, but power goes out, you go camping, right? We'll play card games while camping a so lot. There's, there's waterproof games that are meant to be brought camping. Yeah. So being able to play them anywhere is huge. Right? I'm sure you can get waterproof playing cards, too. Oh, I've had some. Waterproof, yeah. floating, <laughs> right? Yeah. All right, you want to send it? Yeah, we'll send it. Whew. All right. Yeah. So yeah. that's the last point we had here, Ron. So in summary, we'll just wrap up here. We had five criteria that we went over. There is the mental, social, cognitive benefits, I just overlapped that. The, oh, let's start. Well, there's psychological, social, physical. They're fun and they're practical. Hey, you got it. Yeah. So right at the end here, before we wrapped up, I wanted to ask you, what, out of the points we went through, what, what's a point that stood out to you? Hmm. Probably the, like scientific stuff, mm. like the actual uh, cellular level benefits of like reducing stress and uh, teaching you things that you don't get to practice a lot, like mm. those sorts of things yeah. stick out in my mind. Absolutely. What about yourself? For me, it, I, I think I said it at the time, but it was absolutely the history of the war, war women war gamers. Yeah, women war gamers. That's, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. And I, I actually took a Civil War history class. Oh. So it, it just makes sense to me because we would actually do that in class. We would, we would simulate battles. Yeah. He had a sand pit, little figures there, and we would simulate the pieces. So I'm like, wow, that's, that's so cool that what we're, we were doing for practice actually changed history. Yeah. People were doing it for a long time before we ever picked up our games. Yeah. Absolutely. So why don't you guys tell us what stood out to you from this, this episode? You know, go check us out. Our email is shareddiscoveryshow at gmail.com. We're working on getting the Twitter sh set up, so we'll check that out here soon. That should be in the description in the show notes. But we'd love to hear what we missed, what you liked, any f any feedback, right? What, what are the reasons that you like playing games? Mm -hmm. And also, what is fun? <laughs> right, tell yeah. us your definitions of fun because we'd love to read those out 
on our episode about fun. Right, we're gonna do a deep dive and just really figure out what fun is, what it's about, mm -hmm. how it works. Yeah. Maybe learn something, you never know. <sighs> we're gonna learn something. <laughs> it's dense, mm -hmm. I've started, it's dense. Mm. So that about wraps us up, Ron. All right. That wraps us up for episode one of Shared Discovery. So as we close, please make sure to have some fun be kind to each other, and play some games. You want to take us away, Ron? Yeah, sure. Riches must be divided, but real wealth can be shared. Thanks, guys. So long.